Hello, and welcome to the inaugural World War II Emerging Scholars Symposium. I'm Joy Murphy, the Education Specialist for the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum. Today, we or we are pleased to have the Eisenhower, Roosevelt, and Truman Libraries work together in creating this platform for new scholars. Today, we are thrilled to introduce Kendall Cosley. She is going to speak with us about how D-Day shaped G.I. Joe. Hi, good morning. I, I wanna start by thanking the Eisenhower, Truman, and FDR libraries, as well as Joy for putting on this program. It's really wonderful for emerging scholars to have a platform to present their work. And I'm very excited today to present a portion of my dissertation to you. My dissertation looks at the GI subculture in World War II and the creation of the iconic GI Joe image. And today I'll just be talking about how D-Day shaped the GI Joe image into its lasting iconic liberator image. So to begin, when one thinks of D-Day, some of the images that immediately pop into your mind is the soldiers that are kind of hunched down in the landing crafts with their packs and all their gear and they're huddled with their buddies. They're getting sprayed with water and some are sitting in silence. Some are getting very seasick. Others are praying and some are using humor to kind of pass the time. And then the next image that usually comes across is when the ramp to the landing craft comes down and the soldiers start to disembark and they're slogging their way through the water. They're dodging the machine gun fire coming from the beach on the snipers. And it's the struggle to get up on the beachhead to take out the machine gun nest and hopefully to secure the beaches and move forward into France. So these are some of these very iconic details and images that come to our mind when we first hear the term D-Day. And the reason why we have such vivid imagery and details of the soldiers from this event is in large part due to the war correspondents who were there, who either witnessed the action from a distance or they waited ashore with the troops or even the reporters who came in the aftermath in D-Day plus one, D-Day plus two. And they captured the sacrifice and the significance of the D-Day invasion. War reporters captured the danger action and the perseverance of the heroic G GIs on their quest to secure the beachheads on D-Day. Yet their contributions often go unacknowledged in accounts of the event. My presentation will explore how war correspondents that were accredited to the European theater witnessed the, eff the efforts of the American troops and aided in the evolution of GI Joe throughout World War II. My talk seeks to add their stories back into the narrative of D-Day by delving into the process of what it meant to become a war correspondent. And I'll also share some of their experiences and their dispatches from the day of and the aftermath. And most importantly, I'm going to demonstrate how through their contributions, the war correspondents depicted and solidified the iconic image of the tired, dirty, war-hardened GI who persevered in the face of great odds, and he would become the liberator of Europe. Next slide, please. So in order to talk about how D-Day shaped the G.I. Joe image, first I need to lay out what the G.I. Joe looked like prior to D-Day. And really this starts as early as the Selective Service Act of 1940, which created the first peacetime draft and we have a peacetime army of civilian soldiers. And the press starts covering this very early on and they're starting to ask, who are these soldiers? What are they going to look like? Are they going to fight? And so the soldiers themselves are trying to figure out these questions as well. And as soon as they get to the training camps, they create their own division newspapers. And in these newspapers, they start griping about officers and the monotony of drill, and they complain about housing and the mud and the food. And so the press is starting to realize that these, and, and we're mainly talking about army enlisted soldiers that are usually just in the infantry, and they're starting to pick up that they're forming kind of a block, that they have very similar gripes and complaints and interests. And there's not really a name to this phenomenon yet, 
but it will be made when they go to war and they become battle hardened. So when the troops go overseas in 1942, the press follows them. They're embedded with the troops. And this is really where you see the term GI become an actual moniker. So GI stands for government issue. And it's also a way to poke fun at the situation of being a cog in the army machine. And it becomes a very distinct subculture of the enlisted men who don't want to be in a war, but they find themselves in this situation. And it becomes a coping mechanism for them against the harsh realities of some of the officers, of the poor conditions of having to fight in battle. And it's really the war correspondents who pick up on this subculture that the soldiers create, and they're the ones that give it a face and a name. So you see here, there were cartoonists like Dave Bregger and his cartoon G.I. Joe. He was the one that coined the term G.I. Joe. And it also ran as Private Bregger as well. And this cartoon really depicts the GI as this civilian who's not made for army life. He can't really hack it. It's kind of fumbling through. And it's a way to just poke fun of their situation. Uh, this is not their profession, but here they are. And George Baker, who drew the cartoon Sad Sack for Yank magazine, his character is very similar to G.I. Joe. It's still this fumbling citizen that is trying to figure out his place in the army. And then you also have Ernie Pyle, who is perhaps one of the most well-known war correspondents. And he is known for writing the GI view of the war. And so he gives them names and he really personalizes the story. And he talks about how the GI is the guy in the trench that hasn't shaved, he's sitting in mud, but he's joking with his buddies and he's essentially surviving for those around him. So there's a feedback loop that happens, that you, you have the soldiers who create the culture, and then the war correspondents, they draw it, and they write about it, and the soldiers are reading this. Here is Your War was a very popular book that the soldiers consumed uh, when they were in the rear, and they read Stars and Stripes. And so there's this reinforcement of we're reading about who G.I. Joe is and what he looks like, and we're gonna start looking more and more like him. So this is G.I. Joe of 1942. G.I. Joe in 1943 with the Italian campaign is going to evolve. Next slide, please. And this is going to be the G.I. image that will be on the eve of D-Day. This is what the American public and the soldiers think of as G.I. Joe. And this is from Bill Malden, who is a cartoon um, artist for the 45th Infantry Division News. And later he would be picked up by Stars and Stripes. And he drew Willie and Joe. And these are two indistinguishable troops. They're, you know, they're very scruffy looking. You can see the sheer exhaustion. It's very dark, bleak humor from fighting in Italy. This is really kind of entrenched warfare. They're up in the mountains, they're stuck in mud. And this is kind of the just exhausted dog face. And this is the GI image that the soldiers themselves have prior to D-Day. D-Day is going to usher in a new era of the GI image. And this is large part due to the fact that the troops that will be on D-Day are mainly green troops. They have yet to see combat. They've been in training in London for several months. And a lot of the battle-hardened GI Willie and Joes that you see here, they're still in Italy. The Italian campaign is still actively going on. Rome falls on June 5th, 1944, so it's right before D-Day. So one thing to keep in mind is that D-Day is going to create a distinct shift. It's going to evolve G.I. Joe into something new. It's going to be a little more optimistic than the G.I.s that were slogging through Italy. Next slide, please. So that's just the background information of who G.I. Joe was and who he's going to turn into. D-Day is going to allow new leaders to arise. It's going to allow 
a new narrative of the end is in sight and we're going to liberate Europe. So now that we know who the GI was and what he's going to turn into, I want to start introducing what it was like to be a war correspondent in World War II. Over the course of the war, there's over 2,000 reporters that are writing for newspapers from the front lines. They're mainly civilian reporters. So this is men and women. They're usually a little older. They're in their 30s or 40s, so not exactly draft age. And a lot of them want to report on the war because this is a big opportunity to make their career. It's You can get some of the most breaking news stories. You can even cover some of these large battles. So a lot of the reporters want to become war correspondents. And this process, to become a war correspondent, you have to receive accreditation from the War Department. So the newspaper editors apply for it and they say, we want this person to cover the front for our newspaper. And the War Department will vet the reporter. And then the reporters will have to sign an accreditation agreement that says they will abide by military censorship, they will abide by all the regulations that come in a little handbook. And most importantly, if they do not follow the guidelines set out by the headquarters they're assigned to, then they can lose their accreditation. So they will lose all access to the front lines. And if you want to be a war correspondent and make a name for yourself, you have to adhere to this. So many of the reporters are civilians, but after they receive their accreditation, they're treated like officers similar to the rank of a captain, and they wear military uniforms, have war correspondent patches on their uniforms, and they have to carry around a press ID badge that proves that they were accredited for the theater. So you see here that this is A.J. Liebling. He wrote for The New Yorker. He was a war correspondent, and this is his press ID badge saying that he was accredited to the European theater, and that's also the, the patch that he would have worn. Uh, the headquarters were, are going to assign the troops to, or sorry, they're going to assign the war correspondents to what units, and they have to follow those troops. A lot of times there's press camps in the rear, but for if they're in active combat, they're going to be with the soldiers in the foxholes and right next to them in the fighting. Next slide, please. This is Andy Rooney's press regulation handbook. Andy Rooney wrote for Stars and Stripes. And this is essentially the Bible that the war correspondents had to follow. It, it, it was the do's and don'ts of reporting. This is the certain things that you cannot pass through censorship, like troop locations, and if you have any operations. And most importantly, it also talks about how the war correspondents are subject to the Articles of War, so they have to follow military law, and also they can be captured by enemies and treated as spies. So this, this lays out all the risks of being a war correspondent, but it's also a privilege to have access to the fronts. On the eve of D-Day, the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, SHAFE, they accredited around 240 war correspondents for the European theater. It's important to note that not all of them will be on D-Day. There's only going to be a select small group that we'll get into in a little bit, but this is just the general process of getting to the front. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we can meet some of the correspondents that I will be talking about this is just 11 of the roughly 26 correspondents that were either on D-Day or came in the, in the aftermath of the invasion. To start, Andy Rooney, who we saw his press regulation book, he wrote for Stars and Stripes, and he was a soldier. So of the 2,000 war correspondents, majority were civilians, but some were soldiers, and Andy Rooney was one of them. He is probably most famous for after the war when he was on the segment 60 Minutes. The next one we have is Ernest Hemingway, who wrote for Collier's Magazine. And he, of course, is the famous novelist. He was in World War I. He covered the Spanish Civil War. And his estranged wife, Martha Gellhorn, 
who is also a reporter for Collier's Magazine. She is there as well, and we'll get into their kind of convoluted story a little bit later. Very recently, Ken Burns and on PBS had the Hemingway documentary, and they talk about D-Day and the relationship of, of these two reporters, which we'll talk about later. The next one is Ernie Pyle, who wrote for Scripps Howard Newspapers. He is perhaps, like I said, the most famous, and during the war, he wrote two books, Here is Your War, the story of G.I. Joe, which is about the North African campaign, and then he also wrote Brave Men, which is about the Italian campaign. And Ernie Pyle very tragically died in Okinawa by a sniper, so he was one of the roughly 56 correspondents that were killed over the course of the war. Next one is Holbrook Bradley, who wrote for the Baltimore Sun. And there's a funny story on D-Day where they just, they lose Holbrook Bradley. They don't really know where he is for three days. So we'll mention that a little later. Don Whitehead wrote for the Associated Press, and he is on par with Ernie Pyle in terms of how he writes about soldiers. Don Whitehead really wrote the GI view. He tried to personalize their experience as much as he can. However, he never gained the same amount of prominence as Ernie Pyle. Perhaps it's because he wrote for the Associated Press and that's not really the type of news reporting they're known for. They're known for those short, quick, breaking news clips. And he wrote more human interest pieces. He's also known as Beachhead Don and he has, he, he landed at several of the beach invasions. The next one is Tom Trainer, who wrote for Los Angeles Times. And he, like Ernie Pyle, will also be killed during the war. He actually died two months after the D-Day invasion. Robert Kappa is a very famous photographer, and his photographs were sold to Life magazine. We won't be able to really show his photos due to copyright, but he has some of these very iconic images of the GIs in, in their struggle for the beachhead. William Walton wrote for Time magazine. He has some very humorous dispatches and he would actually go on and work with the JFK administration and he was a big supporter of the arts. AJ Leibling wrote for the New Yorker and after the war he has a very prominent career with the New Yorker and he keeps writing for them. And lastly we have Kenneth Crawford from Newswork and there's not a lot of information on Kenneth Crawford but he does pop up on the D-Day invasion. So these are our 11 reporters that I'll say some of their dispatches and really show how they were the movers and shakers for shaping G.I. Joe at D-Day. To get into preparations for the invasion with the war correspondents, part of the Allied planning consisted of tight control of the press. They don't want any information being leaked out since this is a very secret invasion and they don't want to give anything away to the Germans. And Schaefe, in late April and early May, they start rearranging the list of accredited reporters, and they're trying to figure out who is responsible and trustworthy enough to actually be on D-Day. And as the newspaper editors are picking up on the fact that a big invasion is coming, they're trying to get more and more reporters accredited to the theater, but Schaefe in mid-May cuts it off and says, this is what we have to work with. And Schaefe, and mainly Dwight D. Eisenhower, who's the Supreme Allied Commander, they really stress the importance of having reporters at the invasion to capture the campaign and to give the American public the most information that they could. In a statement in April of 1944, Eisenhower said that he viewed reporters as quasi-staff officers and that they were integral to the mission. Don Whitehead, who wrote for the Associated Press, he mirrored the sentiment and said that the army really tried to bring the press in as an, an extension of the army and they wanted them to feel like they were one and the same, that they would look out for them. And from a dispatch aboard an invasion ship on June 3rd, Don Whitehead wrote how a general came up to him and he said, quote, but if an unlucky shell should get you, we'll do all we can. If you're wounded, we'll take care of you. If you're killed, we'll bury you. Meantime, we'll feed you and see you get what you want. So they're treating them akin to the enlisted soldiers that 
they're seeing it as this is all part of the same struggle. In late May, they start getting the reporters that they want on the beach they start bringing them into London. All the reporters know is that there is a big invasion coming. They're not gonna be given much details. They're told that they will get a call or someone will come find them and they'll say, get your stuff. Don't tell anyone where you're going and meet us at the headquarters. Many of them get the call in early June and they're, they're told to report to duty. However, many of them will sit on transport ships for several days before the actual invasion. And it's in this waiting period that the reporters are starting to understand that this GI is going to be something different. That this invasion is ushering in a new phase of the war. And so GI Joe, like he evolved before, is going to evolve again. Don Whitehead really captures this in a dispatch that he writes while he was in London on May 15th. Oh, slide, please. And from his dispatch on May 15th, he writes, quote, the day is drawing close when thousands of American youths, some hardened by months of training, some in actual combat, will storm the beaches of Europe in the supreme test of the infantryman in World War II. The hopes of millions rest with G.I. Joe, the guy who will carry the great burden of battle, take the hardest blows of the enemy, endure the greatest hardships. A little later, he says, there will be great shy youths who suddenly step from the crowd to become leaders. Men who never impressed anyone in training will be heroes and fight with a bravery none had suspected. And Joe and his buddies, they will find they have a strong bond between them. They have fought together and seen their friends die and they have killed Germans together. And he concludes by saying, that's a big job for G.I. Joe, a tough, bloody job, but he's the man who can do it. He did it in North Africa, in Sicily, and on the beaches at Salerno where the 88s were waiting. It's the long road home, and that's really where he wants to be. So what Don Whitehead is picking up on is that there's a little more optimism to this invasion that they know, the soldiers know that this is going to be tough. It's going to be uphill fighting. But there's this theme of the long road home and that they're the only ones that can do it. That they stand on the shoulders of giants, but they are the ones that will become the liberators. Holbrook Bradley, when he was aboard a landing craft, he also starts crafting the iconic imagery of what the GI looks like aboard the landing crafts ready to go. And he said, um, aboard an LST on June 1st, he said, weighed down with packs, bedding rolls, gas masks, ammunition, belts, shovels, canteens, rifles, and pistols, lines of olive drab helmeted men packed transport ships waiting across the English Channel. The men knew by now that this was the real thing. There was an atmosphere of tense anticipation. So what these two reporters are starting to craft is that this is what the GI looks like and this is what we're projecting, that he is the one that he might be scared on the ship, but he's ready. He's anticipating the long road home and they're not gonna stop until the job is done. Next slide, please. So now we're getting to D-Day. And this is just a map to show you, since I'm mainly talking about the American troops and American correspondents, they land at Utah in Omaha Beach. So this is where the correspondents are. Some that come in on the first day land at Omaha, and some of the correspondents that come in the aftermath of the invasion, they usually land at Utah Beach. To give you some background on the conditions that the war correspondents had to face on D-Day, one important aspect is that war correspondents are civilians, so they cannot carry any weapons. So here, just like the soldiers, they're facing German machine guns and sniper fire, and they can't bring anything with them to protect them. There's a story with Kenneth Crawford from Newsweek when he's in the landing craft, and a soldier tries to give him some grenades. 
And he says, oh, no, I'm a war correspondent and we can't carry any weapons. And the soldier looked at him like he was insane because you're about to face, you know, a major enemy and you're going in with nothing. So they are at a bit of a disadvantage in protecting themselves, but their main job is to be a, re a reporter and to capture the story. Another aspect of the invasion is that there's a news blackout. There's a lot of security concerns with leaking information, and so they're not going to be able to get their dispatches out for several days, which is part of the reason why they don't know where Holbrook Bradley is, because they know he gets off the ship, and then they don't hear from him for a long time. So there's a lot of fear of what happened to him. Also, since there was such a high security risk for the invasion, the news associations agreed to pool reporting, which essentially means that they will select a handful of reporters to go and get the stories, and then those stories can be used by all the news associations that agreed to, the, to pool reporting. So this is why we're going to have a very small group of reporters on D-Day. It's roughly 26 reporters, but there's some reports that were 28. Um, and then probably one of the most important points to bring up, which will become a, a point of contention a little later, is the fact that no women were allowed on the beaches. Now, female war correspondents could be accredited to the theater, but they were not actually allowed in active combat zones. So this will be a problem with Martha Gelhorn, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Usually the female correspondents can only go as far as the Women's Army Corps, and so they're not at D-Day, so neither would female reporters. Slide, please. So now the invasion has started, and it's important to note that D-Day is a series of assault phases. They come in waves, and then there's also more troops that come in on D-Day plus one, D-Day plus two. So majority of the war correspondents that come in, they're not in the first phases. They're not in the first waves. They come in after. So this photo shows a view of what a, a war correspondent who came in on the 7th or 8th wave would look at. You can already see troops on the beaches. They've already disembarked some of the vehicles. And one thing that is very prominent about war correspondents in D-Day is a lot of them exaggerate their closeness to the beaches. Again, this is a major event that could make their career. And so they want to claim as much of the glory as they can. Andy Rooney, who wrote for Stars and Stripes, in his memoir, My War, he has a funny line where he says, quote, if all the reporters I've heard about or read about being on the beaches of D-Day were actually there, we wouldn't have needed an army. So he said that they exaggerated so much, there, there were more war correspondents than troops. And this is a common theme. There is this need to build up how close you were. And if you start looking at memoirs or obituaries of some of the war correspondents, it always says they were the first one on the beach. And then when you start adding it up and you're like, well, there's five that were the first on the beach. So who really were the first? And it doesn't really matter who was on the beach first, but it's just the sense of we want to claim this story. So the soldiers and the uh, war correspondents that disembark, they're actively in the thick of fighting. So not only are the reporters supposed to view what's going on around them so they can write a dispatch, their first priority is to survive. And then they have to find a safe place to write their dispatches and try to get them passed through the field sensors and then ship them back home to their reporters. A lot of the initial dispatches from the correspondents on the beaches who they talk about being on a landing craft and disembarking or if they parachuted in with the paratroopers, they're really actively part of the story. They write it from a first person perspective like they are a soldier in it. Tom Trainer is an example of this. He lands in one of the earlier waves and he describes the shells hitting the beaches and the vibrations he felt. He talks about the troops hitting the ground and just the general struggle for the beach that he was a part of. There's also William Walton who parachuted in with the 82nd Airborne Division, with the paratroopers. And he writes a, a funny dispatch about how he got stuck in a pear tree and they had to cut him out and he falls and he bruised like a pear. 
And then he also talked about the struggle that when the paratroopers landed, they were all spread out. So it was a, a struggle to collect everyone and then get back to their mission. Slide, please. Another reporter who writes about actively being in the battle is Ernest Hemingway. An important thing to note is that Hemingway never actually got off the landing craft, but the way that he writes his dispatch, which was titled Voyage to Victory, the way that he writes it, it, it makes it seem like he personally liberated this beachhead. And so from his dispatch, he wrote, quote, no one remembers the date of the Battle of Shiloh, but the day we took Fox Grain Beach was the 6th of June. And then he later talks about this iconic image of the GI in his helmet and he's crouched down. And then he comes back and says, as we came roaring in on the beach, and he talks about how he navigated the ship personally to the landing zone. And for someone that didn't actually get off the ship, he just writes about it in a way of that I was there and I personally did this, which is just one of the themes of the correspondents who were there that day. Robert Kappa captured the magnificent 11 photographs of D-Day that are similar to the Coast Guard photographs of the, the landing, the iconic photo of the landing craft going down and the troops coming out. And Kappa's photos are a lot grittier, and but he really captured what that struggle and the just the, the sheer will it took for the troops to get on the beach in his photographs. A major issue when it comes to war reporting, war reporting is this contest for scooping stories from other reporters, and because of the news blackout. And, and, and sorry, scooping just means that you try to get the story and break it first so that you can get the recognition for breaking the story versus the other news correspondents. However, but because of the news blackout from the beaches, the correspondents that were actually with the assault troops don't get their dispatches out until much later versus those who see it from a distance on the landing crafts. They are able to go back to London and send their reports along the cable and their stories actually get scooped a little bit from the reporters that are on the beach. However, the ones that are on the beach, their reports are a lot more descriptive. They have more engaging stories. Holbrook Bradley is an example of this, how his story doesn't get out for three days when they finally figure out where he is, but his was a later breaking story. Slide please. Most of the correspondents who witnessed D-Day did so from transport ships or larger landing crafts, hospital ships, or rescue crafts. AJ Liebling from The New Yorker, he's an example of this. He was on one of the larger transport crafts for several days, and he talked about the buildup to the war or to the invasion, but he also watched from the deck of the ship, he watched the waves going in and he talks about the blood and the water and his um, ship actually started picking up some of the men that were wounded and floating in the water. But he talks about being a step removed from the invasion since he's watching on the ship and he, he sees it all and then he goes inside and he sits down and he has a cup of coffee and they're talking about the poor bastards on the beach, but he's a step removed from it. So perhaps it gives him a little more objective view of the overall campaign, but he doesn't have really that personal story with it. Another thing with the correspondents who witness it from a distance is there's a lot of jealousy of those who actually made it onto the beach. Like I've said before, D-Day is a major event that could boost someone's career. And so those who couldn't go in are very jealous and there's a lot of competition. And I think Ernest Hemingway and Martha Gellhorn are the prime example of this. Next slide, please. The PBS documentary, the Ken Burns documentary on Hemingway and Martha, they talk about their estranged relationship, how by the time D-Day happens, they're not really on speaking terms. And they're in direct competition on D-Day. And this will essentially 
break what was left of their relationship. One thing the documentary talked about was that war correspondents were not allowed on the beach, which is not true. We know several of them actually landed with, with the troops. Hemingway, however, he was injured in an accident a few days before D-Day, and he had been in the hospital, and he had a huge gash on his head. So they wouldn't let him off of the landing crafts. And Martha, who was not supposed to be in an active combat zone, she finds a way to get on the beach. So she boarded a hospital ship the night before, and she locked herself in the bathroom overnight. And then the next day, she weaseled her way onto the beach. And she acted as a, a stretcher bearer for the hospital ship. And she's able to talk with some people on the beach and get a, a great descriptive story. However, because she did this, because it was against the headquarters direct command that women cannot be there, she actually lost her accreditation. And she would have to find other creative ways to get to war zones after this event. But because she got on the beach and Hemingway didn't, it was the final straw in their relationship. They, they go their separate ways because she had scooped the story from him. I think in the end, Hemingway actually won the scooping contest because his dispatch, his glorious voyage to victory dispatch is published in July and he gets a more prominent spot in the magazine. It's a bigger spread. And Martha Gellhorns isn't published until August and it's not as, as big of a spot in the, in the magazine. Side, please. So the, the GI image from the actual day of the invasion, and you, you can see this here in the photograph that the GIs, they're, they're tired, they're roughed up, they're exhaustion, but you see some smiling in the background and they're getting ready for the next phase. And, and they're getting ready to move on to push through and be the liberators. So from the, the correspondents that are there, they talk about the struggle on the beaches and the death that they witnessed. Um, Holbrook Bradley from June 7th, he wrote, quote, those first few hours on the beach must have been living hell. And we saw there had been no discrimination in the way the men fell. For the two bars of captains were among the plain uniforms of those of the privates. So they're talking about that th this was just an immense struggle to get on and, and it's reflected in how they look. He goes on to talk about the, the grimy, unshaven men that are completely exhausted. Martha Gellhorn, she talks about the humor and the brotherhood of those that survived. She said, men who smiled were in such pain that all they can really have wanted to do was turn their heads away and cry. But they made jokes and they're constantly asking where their fellow GIs were. So the soldiers, the, the GI on D-Day, though he was anxious, he made it onto the beach out of sheer will. He captured strongholds when it seemed impossible. It was tough fighting, but leaders arose. They persisted. And most importantly, they took the first step in liberating Europe. One more aspect of reporting at D-Day is that the reporters who arrived on the beaches in the aftermath of the invasion their one word to describe the invasion was that it was a miracle. Slide, please. And they want the public to know how the GIs moved mountains that day and they sacrificed for the Americans back at home. Bernie Pyle's dispatch titled A Pure Miracle from June 12th, he really drives home this point of the just in awe that they took the beaches at all and why Americans should really pay attention to this. He wrote, quote, now that it is over, it seems to me a pure miracle that we ever took the beach at all. For some of our units, it was easy, but in this special sector where I am now, our troops face such odds that our getting ashore was like my whipping Joe Lewis down to a pulp. In this column, I want to tell you what the opening of the second front in this one sector entailed so that you can know and appreciate and forever be humbly grateful to those both dead and alive who did it for you. So he wants the public and the soldiers to understand how what they did was a, a miraculous 
events. AJ Liveleen, he also talked about when he made it on shore on D-Day plus three. He heard the stories of the soldiers that were pinned down by sniper fire. And a sergeant told him, quote, those infantrymen were like angels, I tell you. I laid there on the beach and I prayed for them while they went up that hill with nothing, with bayonets and hand grenades. They did it with nothing. It was a miracle. Next slide, please. The reporters that came in the aftermath also really highlighted the sacrifice of the GIs and they personalized the stories of those who truly gave all on D-Day. And so the photos show some of the destruction of the beach they would have seen. This part of the this part of the GI image is an aspect that's not always touched on is the, the, the GIs that died in the struggle. And a large part of this is the reporters have to talk about death in sort of a roundabout way. And Ernie Pyle does this so greatly. He talks about the things that were left behind on the beaches that really symbolize the sacrifice of the average Joe who gave all well, so his buddies could keep moving on so they could finish the job. From his dispatch on June 17th, titled A Long Thin Line of Personal Anguish, he wrote, here in a jumbled row for mile on mile are soldiers' packs. Here are socks and shoe polish, sewing kits, diaries, Bibles, and hand grenades. So he talks about all these items. He also said someone had a, a tennis racket that they brought with them that survived the invasion, but he doesn't know if the owner of it did. And he wraps up his dispatch by saying, he sees something sticking out of the sand. Well, they were a soldier's two feet. He was completely covered by the shifting sands, except for his feet. The toes of his GI shoes pointed toward the land he had come so far to see and which he saw so briefly. This theme of the GI boots really hits on the GI subculture of being an anonymous cog in the machine that these boots could have been on any one of them. They're interchangeable. And Andy Rooney also talks about the motif of the GI boots. He said, quote, when I came in row on row of dead American soldiers were laid out on the sand just above the high tide mark where the beach turned into weedy clumps of grass. They were covered with olive drab blankets, just their feet sticking out at the bottom, their GI boots sticking out. I remember their boots, all the same on such different boys. So part of the GI Joe image too is the GIs that fell for the invasion and that they, it's one in a sea of many of them, but they did their part so that their fellow GIs can go on and finish the job. Next slide, please. So for my concluding remarks, I wanna talk about first why the impact of the reporters had an immediate effect on shaping the GI image. So there's a feedback loop that as soon as the reporters get on the beaches, they create press camps to get their dispatches out and Stars and Stripes actually set up their own newspaper building essentially and they start pumping out the Stars and Stripes newspapers for the troops. And the troops are seeing very quickly the writings about what they look like on D-Day and, and how they're gonna act now through the rest of this push through France. So there's an immediate feedback loop there that's solidifying this liberator G.I. Joe. And D-Day was the formative event in shaping this new evolution of the G.I. into the liberator. But it was in large part the reporters who documented the action and they captured the struggle and sacrifice, the endurance and the victory of the soldiers on the beaches. Yet they're often left out of the story and their own experiences aren't told even though they volunteered and they also risked their lives for the invasion. Their writings solidified the G.I. Joe imagery of the, title, of the tired battle-hardened soldier who was scruffy and griped about poor conditions, but fought for his buddy next to him and sustained himself through the humor all the way to victory. This GI 
the one who took the beaches was the one who would liberate France, Germany, the concentration camps, and liberate Europe from the Nazi reign. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this was very interesting. Um, I learned a lot today. This is my favorite part of the symposium, so thank you. Uh, we are going to jump right into the questions. Um, the first question we have says, I know that Hemingway served in World War I and did correspondent work in the Spanish Civil War. In your research, were you able to determine if most other correspondents were veterans? Um, yeah, so there are a few. The ones from the, the Spanish Civil War, so it, it's Hemingway and um, John Steinbeck is also a prominent war correspondent who was at the Spanish Civil War and also in World War II. And the War Department, when they vetted them for accreditation to World War II, they kind of flagged them since they had been in Spain and they didn't know their political tendencies the most like World War II better or um, war correspondents, though, not a lot of them were at the Spanish Civil War. It's a it's a small group. A lot of them had been foreign correspondents though prior to the war, so they were usually some of them were already in Europe covering the European war before American involvement, and then when American involvement happened, then they became American war correspondents. Well, you mentioned um, that. Um they got flagged um, because they had been living in Spain. So the ones who were, all the ones that were living in Europe or who had been war correspondents before, was that process even more rigorous for them? Or it was just those few, those two? It, it was really just the ones that had been covering the war in Spain. The, the foreign correspondents that were over there, they were both subject to the country that they were living in. So if they were reporting from Germany, let's say in 1940, they were, they were subject to German censorship and German rules as well as American reporting rules. But to receive accreditation for the theater, you just had to show that you were going to follow the censorship rules. So they're not flagging a ton of people. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, next question. Did you see correspondents copying each other's writing style in portraying uh, the GI? Yes. So since Ernie Pyle became this very notorious writer in World War II, they, a lot of reporters try to emanate his writings. And I think you see it most with Don Whitehead, who wrote that very similar GI narrative You'll see in a lot of the dispatches, they try to personalize the soldiers by giving their name in their hometowns. And a lot of reporters try to do that so that parents back at home, if they don't know where their son is, they could see where someone else's son was and try to, it gave them a little peace of mind to to say that these were their boys or their brothers. And so really this personalized aspect, that's what gets replicated. Okay, uh, we just got a question that says, how does your work intervene in the historiography? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so the G.I. Joe image is just kind of this assumed identity that it's, it's one of the lasting legacies of the war. We have the G.I. generation, the greatest generation, but no one really talks about how this term got started and who started it and why and how it evolved because the citizen soldier of 1940 is very different than the soldier that liberates the camps in 1945. And so my intervention is to really talk about this generation of soldiers and why this GI image was such an integral part of their wartime experience because it, it gave them this coping mechanism. It gave them a brotherhood. And at the end of the war, it gives them a voice in politics. And you see this with the rise of you get the GI Bill and VA loans and the creation of the UCMJ. So it's it's a very tangible brotherhood, but no one really knows where it comes from or why it was formed or who formed it. 
I, I think uh, sometimes I, you, we talk a lot about propaganda, media propaganda, war propaganda, but here's a perfect example of where, you know, this propaganda ended up being a very, um, very positive thing for for the active soldiers who, or for the soldiers who served. Right. I, I think one thing to keep in mind in World War II, there's a big break between censorship and propaganda. And so the reporters are subject to censorship, but they're not told that they have to promote a certain image. But the ones that are in the foxholes with the troops and they're fighting alongside of them, they feel this kinship with the soldiers. And that's what really gets reflected in their writing. And they want to acknowledge their sacrifice, but also show their awe at what these men who have nothing and they're beaten down, but they still survive. So you, you talked about uh, um, how sometimes the reporters would exaggerate you know, what they did or where they were or some, you know, some part aspect of the story. But then we're looking at these, these reporters, these names, you know, we're talking Andy Rooney, Ernest Hemingway, you know, Martha Gellhorn, who go on to be, you know, these very famous people. So, it, I mean, is it fair to say that this, these exaggerations um, really did help them? So in, in some ways they were right to do that. Well, yes and no, you know, they are reporters first and right. kind of war reporters second. So they're going to do all they can to move their career to the next level. And some of them do become extremely successful after the war. So it makes sense that people would try to latch on to that, that glory of it. There's definitely soldiers that talk about being at D-Day that weren't at D-Day either. And it's you want to hold on to that victorious narrative. Everyone wants to be part of this final glorious push to end the war. Interesting. Um, I wonder, well, they, you know, they've all put out um, uh, biographies, I wonder, but that I have not read. You know, how yeah. do they look back on it and think about, you know, how this built their career? Yes, so some of the memoirs, which I've been looking at for my dissertation, they're, they just, they have fantastic stories. Some of them really write about the troops and what was happening, and others in the memoirs are, I talked to this general, and I was good friends with this person, and so I, it, de it depends on someone's personality. If they saw themselves akin to the GI, like Bill Malden, or like Ernie Pyle, or if they were the Hemingway of I liberated the bar in Paris, you know, personally, <laughs> it's, it's two very different personalities that, that come out in the memoirs. Now, what I do want to go back to is you talked about how the female correspondents could not be on the front line um, and how like Martha Gellhorn failed her way <laughs> to the front yeah. line. Um, and, and now we know Martha Gellhorn to be this, you know, probably, if, one of the most famous, if not the most famous, you know, female war reporter, war correspondent. Um, did you find where any of the other female war correspondents really had like resentment for not being on the front line or not being allowed to be on the front line? Yes. Um, so, so part of the GI image is that it's mainly men are our GI Joes and the African-American soldiers are written out of this narrative too. It's mainly a white male. And the women really resented that. And it, it also mirrored how the Women's Army Corps felt about it too, because they weren't seen as part of this same fighting army. And that's what the journalists, the female journalists pick up on as well. So they feel a little more akin to the wax. And the African-American reporters also feel that too, because they're covering the black troops which is, and they're doing that for like the Baltimore Afro-American and the Pittsburgh Courier. So they're writing mainly for black newspapers. So I think they're all kind of written out of this image, even though we know now that their contributions were really integral in World War II. I, I mean, I didn't think about that, even uh, African-American reporters and, you know, this very, um, the shaping of narrative. Right. Yeah. You have G.I. Joe and then G.I. Jane and then G.I. Joe Lewis. 
And so it's these three separate narratives, even though they're all part of the same army, essentially. I've never heard that term. Yeah, I <laughs> joke. Um, have to look that up. Um, and I think might be the last question, unless another one pops up in the comments. Um, you're talking about the the turnaround time and how you know the stars and stripes were going out. Um, you know, kind of right away. But what is the turnaround time from this event happening to getting to the average person, you know, back in, in the United States? Right. Um, so if a reporter can get to a telephone, they can quickly call New York and tell their story along the line and New York can get that out the same day. If you're on the beaches and you know, you have to wait for a military sensor to go through your dispatch, then you have to find some way to get the story out, that'll be delayed by several days. But when we think of news today and how it's instantaneous, it was still pretty quick for the 1940s because you're still finding out about it. There's newspapers, you know, June 7th that talked all about what happened on June 6th already. And there's some even, if you had like a, a nightly edition that they would have talked about it right away as well. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's a little that's fascinating that in the 40s you could get that turnaround so quickly. Right. Um, so I don't see any other comments or any other questions in the comments. So we will pause right here and take a quick break. Uh, come back at a little spot for the Scholar Spotlight where we will talk to you, Kendall, a little bit more, learn a little bit more about you and your research. Um, so if you are watching, please stick around with us. Um, very quickly, I'll say again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to the Roosevelt and Truman Libraries. For those of you who are not hanging out with us for the Spot Scholar Spotlight, please join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time for our fourth and final day of our Emerging Scholars Symposium, where we will hear from Amanda Hess about flight nursing in World War II. So uh, yeah, we're going to go for a quick break, and we will be back at 11 o'clock. Thank you.
Hello, welcome back everyone, or welcome if you're just now joining us. We are here with Kendall Cosley, who just did a, a fantastic and very interesting presentation of telling us all about World War II correspondence. So now this is our Scholar Spotlight. We are going to ask Kendall a, little, a few questions to get to know her just a little bit better. So thank you again, Kendall. That was very, very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's a lot of fun to talk about my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I bet, you know, that's one of the things that we uh, really like about this symposium, you know, is it's giving new scholars like yourself or emerging scholars like yourself the opportunity to um, kind of dig in and talk about your, your, your work. That doesn't happen as, as often as, you know, sometimes we would like to, for it to happen. <laughs> So we will jump right in and um, ask you the first question, which is, uh, what drew you to your topic? Sure, so when I was in undergrad, I worked at the Marquette University Archives, and I was in charge of digitizing a collection on a foreign correspondent who worked for the Associated Press, and he was in Berlin from 1937 to 1942. And he, his collection contained letters and his own personal photographs, as well as some associated press photographs. And most importantly, it had the copies, the, the, the drafts of his news stories. And you could see how he was editing and reshaping some of his words. And it really got me thinking of how correspondence shaped narratives of the events that we were reading. And you know, there's the phrase that journalists write the first draft of history, and a lot of what Americans knew about the events at the time came from these reporters that were overseas. So it really got me interested in how they shape narratives and how they write about it. And, you know, everything we consume is an interpretation. So I was very curious of, you know, you, you read these letters of him experiencing, experiencing these incredible events, and then he writes about it and it's interesting to see his personal views versus what he's sending back to New York to be published. So that really just like, got me interested in, in how you shape narratives. And then I was reading Ernie Pyle's works on the GI and how he was writing and shaping the GI Joe narrative. So that's kind of how, how the two came together of war correspondence and this GI image. The quote you said was reporters write the first draft of history. Is that what you mm -hmm. said? That's very interesting. I I like that because um, it's very true, right? Um, you know, they're often on the front lines or, you know, they're the first ones to break stories. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's very true. Um, I don't know, though, in, in this day and age, you know, I don't know if it's all as true as it was back then. <laughs> Yeah, the news from 1940 has, has definitely changed since news today. So <laughs> there, there's a lot more information floating, floating around out there. I think it's a lot easier to, to be on the front lines, and even if you're not a journalist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, okay, so tell us a little bit about your research methods, your process. Um, Sure. So the bulk of my research rests mainly on the writings of the correspondents. So their actual dispatches, many of them write memoirs after the war as well. I've also been looking at the newspapers like the Stars and Stripes, the Yank Army Weekly. There's also the newspapers that the troops produce at the training camps. And so and I've been looking at these and looking at the cartoons. And I initially just started looking at what they say about the GI. And is that a term that they use or what do they call these soldiers? And it became very evident early on that there was certain themes of how they talk about the enlisted men culture. And then I started seeing the evolution of, it's just this group of draftees and then it becomes more solid over time. And so when I've been going through my process, it's, you know, the, the GI in 1940 looks like this, and this is what we call him. And here are his gripes and his issues with the army. And then I'm, I've been watching in the newspapers and in the writings as it progresses what this subculture is and how they're talking about it. 
So it's, it's so, been an evolution. <laughs> so in doing that, did you, did anything surprise you as you were doing your research? Yeah, one of the things that surprised me the most is how tolerant the army is of the newspapers. And this is when I get back to the point of they're not necessarily promoting propaganda because they write about the officers that they don't like. And they have columns and stars and stripes called um, bee bag, which is blow it out here. And they can you know, gripe about what this second lieutenant made them did. And they're very open with the fact that you can gripe about the army, you can have complaints. And which to me was just surprising that the army put up with that. But it was Eisenhower who is a main supporter of it. He wanted the troops to have an outlet. And so if you could laugh at Bill Malden's cartoons about a GI getting splashed by an officer in a Jeep and then him saying, oh, why are you so dirty? And if they could laugh about the experience reading the newspaper or see that someone else had their complaints, then it was an outlet for the soldiers that was relatively harmless and it wouldn't boil up in actual combat. So that, that really surprised me the most is just this transparency that the army allowed through the newspapers. And were there any um, any of the, the officers, did any of them complain or and it just fell on deaf, deaf ears or did they just kind of think it was par for the course and you just have to put up with it? Oh no, Patton could not stand. Uh, <laughs> he couldn't stand war correspondents, he couldn't stand the newspapers. He did not like Bill Malden, the the kid cartoonist, because Bill Malden really, he kind of went after some of the officers in his drawings. And Patton said that, you know, he didn't want to, him to cause insubordination. And Patton actually talks about the fact that the soldiers were looking at Willie and Joe and seeing how scraggly they were. And he said that the army was starting to look more and more like Willie and Joe. And so he talks about this feedback loop is actually tangibly happening. And he doesn't want that. He wants it to stop, but that doesn't reflect his army. And Eisenhower kind of puts the kibosh to it. He says they can still do it. He's not causing any harm, really, but I think Patton's ego is just hurt a little bit. <laughs> All right. So um, what were your biggest challenges with studying and researching this topic? So the biggest challenge I'm running into right now with kind of this D-Day liberator narrative on is that you have the actual GI subculture of what's happening, um, you know, in the front lines and when they're in some of the rear camps. But then there's also the projected GI image. And for the most part in like 40, 41, 42, 43, the culture and the image are pretty married. It's a direct reflection of what's going on. In 44 with D-Day, there seems to be a break because you still have the GI culture of this sex, we're in the mud, it's cold, we're wet, we don't like this officer. But the newspapers, as we just saw, are starting to talk about the liberator GI. And so there's kind of this breaking point. And I'm trying to really figure out kind of why there is this breaking point or how exactly it comes about. And so I, Bill Malden has this great cartoon and it's the soldiers that it's raining and they're dragging their packs and they're walking and there's like a, a banner that says, you know, the rejuvenated GI troops are liberating France. And then you have the GIs that are like just completely done, you know, so, so there is a break in what is being projected back to the public of our boys are doing it and they are, but they don't necessarily see it maybe in as great of a light as the newspapers are. So mm -hmm. I'm trying, this is the balance I'm trying to strike. Okay. Um, are you finding many soldier narratives? Uh, so like, you know, their own experiences um, being recorded where you would be able to dig into that or, or is that part of the, the struggles? No, there's a lot of combatant memoirs, especially from D-Day. D-Day is, you know, it, it, public consumption of D-Day is incredible. So there's a lot of that. And I think part of the problem is, is that there's this GI liberator narrative and it was a lot for the soldiers to live up to. And I think in their memoirs, 
there's kind of this fear that they didn't live up to this greatest generation. They didn't live up to this GI stereotype, um, which the culture is still there. They're very much part of that culture, but then it's maybe this iconic lasting image that gets really blown up. And over time it has to, it's still a very iconic thing that we're still talking about. The current army just brought back the pink and green uniforms that the GIs wore in World War II. So there's still a lot of fascination with this GI image. Right. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not as big of a deal as I'm making it out to be, but I think there is a slight break. And so I'm just trying to strike that balance. I certainly hope you're able to find that because it would be interesting to um, read about that and hear about that and, and, and how that unfolded. Um, so that we'll segue that into what's next for you? What's next with your research? What's next with your education? Whatever. What, what is your future looking like? Sure. So I'm a PhD candidate now, so I'm officially in the fun stage of the doctoral process where I'm actually researching and writing my dissertation, which I am hoping to have done um, in a year or two. I would love to get this published into a book. I think it, it matters to the GI generation and uh, especially to their families too, as a lot of GIs are now starting to pass away. And so we're going to lose this greatest generation. So I would love to get this published and I would love to be able to teach about World War II as well and, and American military history and the press at large. Okay, well, when you get your, um, your dissertation published and it's this fantastic book that is well reviewed, of course, we, are, we would be excited to have you at Eisenhower. Um, can't speak for Truman and FDR, but... <laughs> For over here at Eisenhower, we would love to have you. And, you know, we're, you know, your cheerleaders and your supporters. So we'll be, we will be excited and thrilled to read about and to host you um, when all of that is done. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you for giving me this platform to introduce my dissertation and kind of a public stage. And um, I, I really had a great time. I've enjoyed it. You're very welcome and thank you for um, submitting and coming and, and telling us a little bit about what you're working on. Um, that was my last question. So uh, to everyone watching, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you tuning in. And again, join us tomorrow for our fourth and final day with Amanda Hess, who will tell us about flight nursing in World War II. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and have a wonderful day.